In March of 1981, the rock album Spirit of St. Louis was released. It was the American pop singer Ellen Foley's second studio album. But what made this record so unique was that it was produced by Mick Jones, the lead guitarist of The Clash, who, along with his co-member Joe Schrubber, wrote six of the 12 tracks that appeared on the album. All four members of The Clash also played on the album, with Strummer and Jones providing most of the guitar parts. Paul Simonon played bass, and Topper Heaton was on drums. While Clash associates and members of the Blockheads, Norman Watt Roy played additional bass parts, Mickey Gallagher added keyboards and piano contributions, along with guitarist John Turnbull and saxophonist Davey Payne. Strummer's good friend and fellow musician, Hyman Dog, contributed to the album by writing three songs, and playing violin as well. The Spirit of St. Louis was recorded in the late summer of 1980 in the now-defunct Wessex Sound Studios in London, England. The Clash was finishing up their final tracks on their most recent studio album, Sandinista, and they used the same recording setup. The album was produced by Mick Jones, who was credited as My Boyfriend, along with heavy input from studio engineer Bill Price. According to an interview that Ellen Foley did with Gave Me In Love, the album was going to be an Edith Piaf rock and roll sounding record, a mixture of a few covers with original music from the duo of Strummer and Jones. Ella Foley also said that she wanted to do something different from her first album, Night Out, which was produced by Mick Ronson and Ian Hunter. During this time period, Mick Jones and Ella Foley were a romantic couple, and he became a big influence on her life. The two were inseparable. She even appeared on a Clash album, singing the duet with Jones on the single Hitsville UK, which appeared on Sandinista, along with an unreleased song, Blonde Rock and Roll. Needing a second album for her label, Cleveland International Records, Foley and Jones decided to record the album right after the band finished Sandinista. Joe Strummer wrote the lyrics to the six songs that the duo contributed to the album. According to Foley, no, he kind of went off and wrote them. I wasn't even going to tell him what to write. In a way, it was sort of a difficult period for me because I was just there to, as a singer. Joe Strummer was a really extraordinary person in how empathetic he was. I wasn't surprised that he could write songs from a woman's point of view at all, and I didn't feel uncomfortable at all with the material. Joe was such a bohemian, you know. He was so open to anything. Mick Jones wrote the melodies for the six songs and fully talked about how she tried to collaborate with him. Mick and I would have discussions about keys because I would ask, what key? And Mick would be like, what? What? You can sing it. You don't need to sing in the key. He almost didn't understand because, you know, they just wrote. They didn't even think about keys. They just wrote for Joe. But as a singer, I have to sing in specific keys, obviously. So I kind of think the whole vocal end of it was downplayed a little bit, actually. And I could have shown a little bit more than I did vocally on that record. I think it was most interesting musically and lyrically, but in terms of vocals, it wasn't really an Ella Foley record. I mean, it really was more of a Clash record, whether you like it or not. I think that my first album and the Meatloaf material really showed off how I sing, you know? But it kind of thing was just a an anathema to the whole situation with The Clash. The only thing I remember really arguing about was this thing about specific keys, and it was like a concept that they didn't get. But I was very enthusiastic and accepting because it was a really exciting project for me, and it was also for them doing something different that was tailored to, to something that they wanted to do for me. I mean, they wrote them, but those weren't Clash songs by any stretch. The tracks that Strummer and Jones wrote were The Shuttered Palace, MPH, Torchlight, and The Killing Hour, and The Death of the Psychoanalyst of Salvador Dali. Time and Dog wrote the tracks Beautiful Waste of Time, Game of Man, and Indestructible. They were songs he recorded previously as a solo artist. Ella Foley herself would write the song Phases of Travel, and the final two tracks were an English version of the French pop song my Legionnaire, and a cover of the 60s song, How Glad I Am. The album was released in conjunction with Epic Records and Cleveland International on March of 1981, a couple of months after the Clash's single, Hitsville UK, dropped. 
Spirit of St. Louis peaked at number 57 on the UK charts before disappearing. The album was hardly promoted by the record company and was ignored by the music press. Two singles were released from the album, and they were the strongest songs. The single that should have made the album chart higher was the song Torchlight, which featured a duet between Mick Jones and Ellen Foley. The Clash and the Blockheads were only credited by their first names on the inner sleeve of the album, but Strummer and Jones's credits appear on the record's inside label on the six songs that they composed. Foley and Jones would remain a couple until the recording of Rap Patrol from Fort Bragg, which would later be renamed Combat Rock. The Clash's biggest hit song, Should I Stay or Should I Go, may or may not be written about the couple's fiery relationship. Foley would release one more studio album in 1983, Another Breath, which saw her return to a more pop sound of her first album, but it failed to chart. Can The Spirit of St. Louis be considered a lost Clash album? In my opinion, not really. The music sounds like a conventional rock album of the early 80s, but the two singles, Torchlight and Shuttered Palace, along with the tracks Theater of Cruelty, could have easily been placed on Sandinista along with the Time and Dog written songs. Overall, the music sounds a bit rushed. Maybe The Clash should have taken a break from the studio and worked on the material a bit more with Ellen Foley and given the songs a chance to mature after going over a few more drafts because they could use some fleshing out. But it's also a shame that the record label didn't promote the album because considering the time frame it was written and recorded in, it's not that bad and there are a few hidden gems inside. But no, it's not a lost Clash album. Just an interesting collaboration between a pop singer and a punk rocker that sadly didn't get a lot of exposure. I hope you have enjoyed this episode of Cuppy's Music Curios. My name is Cuppy, and I hope to see you soon. Cheerio!